Now, I'm only going to say a, a few things about uh, Mark because, as most of you know, he has been here for many, many years, uh, since 1980. And uh, he retired last year and went to the University of Mirror College Park. He is leading a program there as a deputy director. And currently, he's also acting as the director of that uh, institute, research institute. So he's from retirement, he's going to more retirement there, or more work there. <laughs> Let's put it that way. So there are a few things that I thought would be very interesting for this audience. Now, few of us can actually use the word pioneer in their, in their career. Few of us. But Mark Imhoff uh, can proudly say that we pioneered uh, the use of radar in mapping of uh, topography, vegetation, and so forth. So to his credit, he has done a lot of work uh, concerning that work. Now also, uh, which is becoming very, very popular nowadays, the, the Earth at Night uh, images. Now some of you may not know that Mark actually was behind some of those early initiatives of the Earth at Night. And in fact, that ties very closely to the topic he's going to talk about here, the urbanization in the Anthropocene. So without taking a lot of time, Please help me welcome Mark Imhorn. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And so uh, there'll, there'll be no worthwhile science in this talk, I promise. <laughs> no, that isn't really true. Um, uh, it, it, is a, it is a pleasure to, to be here. And I've only been gone from Goddard for six months. And it's taken at least six months for me not to go to the Department of Energy and then talk about NASA and say, we, 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 while I'm representing Pacific Northwest National Labs. Um, and so thankfully, they were, they've been pretty forgiving on that score. And so um, I'm going to use this talk as a pretext to sort of discuss the history of my coming to NASA because I think it also it speaks a little bit to an era that we all experienced, at least some of us in the room experienced, and, and the rest may, may enjoy as a bit of uh, history. Uh, as Charles referred to, I do have a fairly long history in looking at radar um, and synthetic aperture radars for biomass uh, evaluation and vegetation penetration. I'm not going to talk about any of that because I could actually have an entire I could have an entire um, uh, uh, maniac talk on that and talk about how, how it was to run expeditions into the mouths of the Ganges in a tiger infested swamp and with coordinating with the space shuttle. But I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about something, something different. And, and uh, this was an outgrowth. I'm going I'm to talk about what we as human beings are doing on this planet, how we're affecting it, and what our trajectories look like with biogeochemical cycles and a few components of the bio, of a very specific component of the biogeochemical cycle, um, which relates to net primary production, food, and energy. Um, and it's becoming um, increasingly apparent, I think, that as, 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 as time goes on, that you really can't study biogeochemical cycles without the human element. You just can't do it. We're, we're primary drivers of the, of, of the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle, and if you include melting of, of ice caps, we are the primary driver in the freshwater cycle. And that's without, you know, without looking at the rerouting of rivers for hydropower and agriculture and so on. So um, that's becoming more and more known. Um, yet it's, a, it's at a time when uh, the coupling of models brings us to a point where if we, if we really want to look at projecting weather, for example, out 40 years forward, it would be really nice to ignore the pesky human element. Because um, that way you go back to first principles and you just get dump it, you know, throw it over the transom. But I'm going to show here that we really can't do that. And there are people interested, it's not quite mainstream, but it's growing, I think it's growing considerably, about looking at what human beings do. And so there are people, I love this, this graphic uh, has gotten more, well, I'm going to try to play it, see if I can get it to work. I can't get it to roll. Oh, there it is. This was created right here, and the people in this room actually, actually created this. I've gotten, this is old now, I mean, there's a whole new City Lights version of this. Um, but I like this one because it's bright, and you can see the daytime 
sort of uh, greenness index data looking at, the, at the, co the continents. And this has gotten a lot of um, response from public audiences that I've given this to. And I've probably given 100 talks as part of uh, Sigma Psi Distinguished Lecturer Series. And when I tell people, I said, if you come in from 22 or 23,000 miles out and you're an alien spacecraft and you see the Terminator roll over there, you know it's occupied. Earth is occupied. So, you know, the, uh, there's no question about it. And uh, what's interesting about those data, the, the, the nighttime data set, um, is that uh, they've revolutionized our view of the planet and really have, have um, opened the door to the concept more than a concept, but that the potential reality that we are in the Anthropocene. And we have this, we're actually in an era where human interaction, human action will be visibly present in the geologic strata, for example. That's one criteria for, for designating a, a geologic era. Um, but it took, it took somebody of pretty high stature to begin to say it publicly before it caught on. And there was a big time gap between Paul Crutzen saying this, making this quote, and the economist uh, and sort of the mainstream uh, society looking at it. Okay, one of the things that I really got interested in, I, I, I came to NASA purely by accident. And um, I never expected to work for NASA. I wanted to feed the world. Uh, I went to Penn State and got a degree in agriculture. And I thought my trajectory was going to be mapping soils and developing grains for increased food production around the world. That was what I thought I was going to do. Then this, this thing called Landsat came up, and next thing I know, I was doing something very different. Um, but I've always been interested in human actions. And I actually started out in Asian studies uh, and anthropology. And so if you think about where we are now, it didn't come out of nowhere. And one really important thing, if you're a biologist or, or an, an ecologist, you really get this, is that what we do on the planet's surface, and in, well, more on the planet's surface, not the oceans yet, but we push ecosystems to generate products faster than they would normally. Okay, and so think about rates. Whenever, we're, whenever we discuss biogeochemical cycling, human interactions, um, our impact on biogeochemical cycles, think rates. Rates are really important. Okay, so where do we come from? This, was the, this is a crude map of sort of the Earth's surface uh, prior to agriculture. And so as most of you know, uh, land cover is now seen as an important factor in, in uh, climate. Uh, it has an influence, uh, the, the, uh, the carbon cycle, the energy cycles, the water cycles, you know, with albedo, emissivity, all of that um, is now seen to interact with, with climate. Um, that wasn't always so. I remember in the hallway of Building 22, 30 years ago, raging arguments about how humans have no effect on climate whatsoever, including greenhouse gases. <coughs> this is 30 years ago. And the idea that land cover would have any interaction with climate, absolutely preposterous, bad science. People should be fired for even saying it, seriously. Uh, so, and, and I think it's important, I think that's important because the public needs to know that this science evolves. Science evolves and climate science is, has evolved and it's still evolving. You know, we're still, we're still teasing out interactions and trying to understand what matters and what doesn't. Anyway, the point of this slide is that the populations were fairly low. I'm not sure how they estimate those populations, but the idea here was is that most people were nomadic, so they would wander from ecosystem to ecosystem and they would generally consume products of photosynthesis at the rate at which the natural ecosystems would provide them and when they, ex when they exhausted one, they would go to another. And there would be time between the time that they left you know, and came back. At some point, populations became too, too large, possibly, and the next time you went to your favorite clam bed or your orchard, there were people there with pointy sticks. And what did we have to do? We had to create a situation where we could generate products of photosynthesis faster than Mother Nature would, would generate them for us and to select the crops that we liked. Okay? And so this is agriculture. And now uh, we have something like 43%. This is just a very rough number. 
something like 43% of the, of the uh, usable terrestrial surface is dominated by agricultural systems. Um, okay, so what does this mean? Um, well, certainly if you're interested in climate change, this is a pretty dramatic shift because you went from natural systems to these human dominated systems. But it also did something else. Agriculture provided the basis for everything that we consider civilization today. When you're nomadic, you can't build, there's, there, there's no sense in building a permanent structure. So if you can imagine when agriculture happened, you could sit in one place, you could have specialization like you never could before. So you have people who were scholars and, and, and people who you know, knew about medicine and so on and so forth. Um, and you could develop architecture because now you know, you're gonna live there permanently. So it's really the birth of architecture. It's the birth of everything that we know of civilization right now. We owe that to agriculture. And there are some really interesting discussions about whether that was the biggest <coughs> mistake in the human race. I won't get that, I, I won't go there, but Jared Diamond has written some very fascinating early pieces on, on whether or not that was, it was a good idea for us to actually do this. But uh, I, I think it's very entertaining um, and, and, and interesting. Um, okay, uh, urbanization. Okay, now something like three to six percent depends on which whose evaluation you you look at is now in urbanization, and uh, I'm going to get back to this because so what? It's a small amount of surface area, but it turns out that some of the research that we've done here with Lahori and others show that that three percent all land is not equal. That three percent turns out to be fairly significant impact on the on the terrestrial carbon. Uh, uh, production capability because they are the very, very best innate soils, native soils for, uh, for uh, biological productivity. Population curve, I like to show this, especially for non-biologists non, uh, to get the point of exponential growth across. And so most people in this room know about exponential anything, but in biology we love to have a um, a little lesson for the graduate students, which is if you have a pond algae that doubles its surface area every day and in, day, and in 16 days it covers the entire pond, how much of the pond is covered on day 15? Only half. So what does that mean? It means that exponential growth in populations means greatly accelerated and quite surprising resource uh, consumption. So it's very surprising. and so. That brings us to, you know, where are we with all of this? And so, one of my favorite, one of my favorite, um, because it's it's intellectually exciting. It's not like I believe in it, but we are all bollocked up over. I hope that's not a swear word. It probably is in England, but I, I don't know. We are all messed up over Thomas Malthus's dismal theorem, and this thing's over 200 years old. Um, but he based this on observation at a time when human societies did not want to believe we were doing anything but evolving toward this golden heavenly state. And what Thomas Malthus did is he looked at ant populations, okay, in his, in his native England, and then he looked at population growth and, and decline in um, London, and he said, you know what? We go through this cycle. And ever since then, uh, we're, we're interested in this because people think it's a doomsday scenario. Well, that's open for debate, you know, because even now there are some societies going through a kind of collapse in doomsday scenario. But, but uh, we've gone through this cycle and we're still going through it. Malthus is right, Malthus is wrong, Malthus is right, Malthus is wrong. Malthus plays out in certain places like Haiti. Malthus, you know, and we have a history of looking at declines and if you look, if you read Jared Diamond's um, book Collapse, he discusses it. Historians now say, well, that's really the norm. It's just not necessarily the apocalypse, right? And, and so we're very fascinated by this. Well, um, and it's interesting. So, you know, what are we supposed to actually believe with all of this? And recently, this, uh, I, I had heard about this, but I'd sort of come face to face with it more abruptly in my new position. Um, is that there's this old MIT model, it's called Club of Rome. So if you ever want to Google it, just read Club, Club of Rome. These guys essentially predicted that, you know, with resources becoming scarce and our inability to manage would, and the population growth would get to a certain point, that in approximately 2030, not too far away now, there would be an enormous population 
crash. I mean, like this is huge, like culling, culling the human population back. Then a few years ago, a group came in and said, yep, look at those trajectories. They're, they're right on track. This is the sort of the zone where they looked at these new trajectories. And so people love to get whipped up about this. Um, the problem is, is that there is a lot missing. You know, first of all, our projections on, on, on energy resources are not necessarily very good. And that's actually something I would love to, to have discussions with, with people, because it appears that, for example, all that peak oil and end of oil and you know, the a AGU meetings we had about how the oil was going to end, apparently that's all wrong. So how, you know, how did we get it so, so, so wrong? So uh, big caveats to this. So what do we do about it? Um, I think that the people here at Goddard Space Flight Center, at NASA, people at the Department of Energy, NOAA, other, other organizations, I don't mean to leave anybody out, but we have developed technologies to actually address this for the first time ever. Because the reason why we could never understand whether or not these collapses could occur is because we couldn't close the system. But now, with our technologies that we have, we can close the system, and this is one of the reasons why. Okay, I was... <coughs> I'd like to say I remember this, but I don't. I think I was six or something. But this was our very first image of planet Earth from space. And it's terrible by today's standards. I mean, you, know, you look at that and you go, huh. But that revolutionized what we thought we could do with satellite data. People, for the first time, said we can map clouds. We can map weather. We can start to study the interactions between climate. Uh, between the atmosphere and, and, the, and the Earth's surface. Uh, Jerry Soffin, some of you know Jerry, told me that when the, when the first uh, satellite images went up with Landsat, they were double checking to see if they had actually mapped the coastlines correctly. And there was a lot of corrections that went on. Um, so it's, it's very surprising. So, you know, that's our humble beginnings. This changed the psyche of the world. This was, this was a photograph taken uh, from um, the Apollo mission. Um, Apollo 17 on its way out, I think, toward the, toward the uh, moon. And uh, this image really, I, I, I remember this, because I remember people going, oh, we're all on one planet, and this was sort of gave a big impetus to the environmental movement, because people suddenly became very aware that we are on a finite resource. Before that, it wasn't very clear to anybody that we were on a finite resource. It's really interesting. It's the most washed image. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the, the, you know, the Apollo astronauts said that you know, the Apollo mission started out to explore the moon, but they discovered the Earth. But it's because of these photographs. Yeah. <clears throat> now we have the Library of Alexandria. So I think everybody could be proud about this. And when I, when I give public talks, I say, this is what NASA did with your tax dollars. So this is open to everybody. And it's literally the Library of Alexandria of Earth Science data. And so when we talk about climate change and connections between processes, you know, we're, we really know what we're talking about because your tax dollars built this resource. And it's available and open to anybody who wants to see it and use the data. And a lot of people don't know that. It's surprising. They're, they're like, you know, their mouths are open. They, they love it. By the way, Talking about these, so I'm just showing this, showing these, you guys know what this is, but showing how these assets work, showing first that there's a huge asset there and, that these a and how the asset works will leave people with a sense of empowerment when they're facing climate change issues. And that's really important because if all you do is depress people and they want to slit their wrists, that's no good. But if you show them the tools that we have, it really transforms how they view the problem. All of a sudden, they're energized, and they feel like, yeah, we can, you know, yes, there's big changes out there, but we can, we can attack them. We can, we can address them. We really can do it. And, that, and that's important. Um, I love these. Uh, everybody's seen these now. This is the Defense Meteorological Satellite. Now we have better, better versions. I'll show you those. But uh, um, in the 1990s, my god, that's back in the 1900s, back in the 1900s, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, before the EOS missions were launched, uh, we needed a way to map cities. And Lahori and I were, were worrying about this because there were all these issues coming up. And we did, you know, like, well, you know, do we urbanize the best soils? And people were saying no, and some people said yes. Nobody really knew. And what we found out was that we had no global data sets that told us where cities were. 
and to accumulate all the map data and try to patch it together was just an almost impossible task, and it was error-ridden. Well, I was walking down the hallway of um, uh, Building 21, and the astronomy club was having a protest meeting about, night, about city uh, lights at night blowing their view of the nighttime sky, and I said, where did you get that image? And it was a terrible, you know, like fax image, and they told me, and so I got on, got on the phone and started making some calls, and then uh, before you know it, a friend of mine, uh, a colleague out at NOAA NGDC, Chris Elvidge, we got together and um, made these data public. Um, but I have heard from a lot of people from all the way from earth science out to urbanization studies and anthropology tell me that these, these data have been the most transformative ever because it really showed people for once and for all, not only where the cities were, that was a big boon for urban studies, so that, that was like, you know, it, whole, it initiated an entire new thrust in urban studies, actually. Um, but it convinced a lot of the rest of the world, including the business world, by the way, that, huh, humans are kind of a fairly big impact on, on the planet. Um, and I, th I know you've all seen this. These are fires. Remember, this goes back to the ecosystem modification, uh, biomass burning. People do this for many different reasons, to bring uh, enhanced grazing is probably the primary one, but there are other reasons. Still going on worldwide. Fishing fleets, so we're mining the resources. Oil flares, this is, this is sort of a, when I was here at NASA, I wasn't too keenly interested in these. I, I sort of recognized that they were there and they were important. But in my new job, these are becoming more of an issue because a lot of energy is lost in the gas because of the energy density issues. It's very expensive to capture gas off oil wells and ship it anywhere. Oil's one thing, but gas is another. You have to compress it and do all these things to it. Um, so important data set. And here's India. It shows an example of the economic growth in India. Big changes on the land surface. Okay. Uh, Everybody is super excited about the new SUMI MPP low light data. I mean, here's San Francisco Bay Area, and you can just see, and this isn't even as good as it looks in reality, but there's the old DMSP, and that's pretty much the way the DMSP looked. Maybe a little worse, but, um, so people are very excited about that. Um, okay, so why do we care about this thing called MPP? And I, I try to get this across. Many, many audiences don't know what NPP is and you confuse it with the satellite, but it's net primary production. And the key here, the key lesson is, is that net primary production is the amount of plant material left over from photosynthesis after respiration. So that's what's available for the food web, which is Earth's heterotrophs, of which we are one of. So get that English right. We are heterotrophs. So it's our food web as well. Um, and since it's created from carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, it's sort of the common currency for climate change uh, and ecological and economic assessment. So I try to get that across. People love this one. This was generated here. It's kind of, old, you know, it's, it seems old. This is, this is quite old. This is CWIFS data. So it's by our standard, it's old. But this is a wonderful teaching device because I, you, there's so much in here. When you can talk about, you know, the NPP in the oceans and the NPP on the land surface, and why do you have that zigzag? Well, you have the zigzag because there's more land mass in the northern hemisphere than there is in the southern hemisphere. So there's a signal in the carbon dioxide. If they were equally distributed, there'd be no signal. It would just be a line going up because of fossil fuel additions. So it's loaded. This is loaded with. Um, with teaching possibilities. And the fact that the terrestrial biosphere actually has a remarkably strong signal, despite the fact that you know, we're mostly, uh, uh, there's mostly oceans. Um, and by the way, um, the, the, the total amount of NPP in the oceans is somewhat s remarkably similar to what it is on land, even though there's a lot more, uh, a lot more surface area on the ocean, and volume, certainly. But, uh, um, they're very, very similar. So the land component is really important. So I'm just going to go through these quickly, but this shows what we were able to do with the nighttime lights. For the first time ever, we overlaid the nighttime lights data, showed where cities were globally. We scrubbed them as best we can to reduce blooming and all those things that you do when you're a remote sensing guy. And we overlaid them on uh, uh, soils maps. For the first time, I found out that we preferentially 
urbanize the best soils. And it's not because we hate agriculture, it's because the same engineering qualities that make a soil good and easy to produce agricultural crops also make it easy for construction. And the very first parameter is slope. No slope is really good for both construction and for agriculture. And so the interesting thing here then, and this is where we, get, we come back to the pressure onto the, onto the rest of the system, is that uh, China, the United States, just about anybody who can has said, we're going to go ahead and urbanize or develop, we're going to develop agricultural lands because the economic growth that we will realize from that will allow us to purchase agricultural products from elsewhere. And so that is the strategy. That's the long-term strategy that the whole world is going on now, doing now, with the exception of some countries that are beginning to rethink the issue. It's interesting. Uh, what do you lose? It turns out that you actually do lose quite a bit. And this goes back to this, not all soils are created equal. So even though you may urbanize a fairly small amount percentage-wise of the surface area, um, it turns out that those soils are very highly productive compared to the ones that are surrounding them and not urbanized. And again, it goes back to the, to the soil qualities. Um, and that even though you have only 3% of the area in, in urbanization, you may have a much higher percent reduction of the overall sort of continental potential productivity. Now, what does this mean? Well, we, we tracked it. Uh, Lahori and I did this study here. We tracked it and figured out that we actually computed it and backtracked it to actual produce lost, you know, agricultural produce. And it was enough to feed 16.5 million a year that we lost by urbanizing certain soils. Um, why are we not starving? Because we have a distributed global transportation system. And we'll get, I'll talk about that coming right up. Right, another big question we thought we could ask now with these data is, can the earth keep up with our consumption rates? Remember I talked about rates. So, uh, you know, this is a rate-driven enterprise we've got here. Um, human beings consume or require, let's put it this way, human beings require a certain output rate from the terrestrial systems. And uh, the question is, is, you know, is there, a, is there a ceiling that we're gonna hit? So we thought, well, here's what we'll do. We'll look at the MPP from satellites We'll look at the human demand from the Food and Agriculture Organization. We'll try to backtrack that demand to the same thing that the satellite sees, and then get a balance map. <coughs> there. Okay, so for those of you that know satellite uh, data extraction, this is essentially what we did. We had a long baseline. We used AVHRR initially because that's what was available. Actually, it, this, is some, this is somewhat old, so uh, we didn't really go all that to 2010. Um, then we use terrestrial carbon models, which adds the, the missing components like precipitation, soil type, um, uh, uh, solar radiation, and all that to come up with the average biological productivity in grams, petagrams of carbon for planet Earth. And so this was for 1982 through 1998. And this contains all of our agricultural advancement. It also averages out interannual variability and all those things. But this is about what you get, about 56.8. More recent estimates for satellite are actually a little bit lower. So this number, I think, is an active area of research. And I think it'll be very interesting in the next 10 or 20 years to see what that number really is. Uh, but that's, the, that's what we came up with. Um, the UN data, I will, I'll go through this pretty quickly. Again, we took all the products that had their basis in products of photosynthesis, including livestock, and figured it out by country per capita. And that was the development chain. It's all published in Nature and JGR, if you want to go look at the old stuff. Um, and came up with this sort of consumption or requirement map. Um, it's, it's really, we call it... Um, we called it uh, human appropriation of NPP, but that's an old term. It's really the amount of NPP required to generate the products that are accounted for every year in FAO. Uh, but it's about 20%. And if you look at, uh, we updated this a little bit, it's climbing, 20, 25, 28. What does this mean? Well, nobody really knows exactly what it means. I mean, that's part of the science and research is that you, you do these inventories. We don't really know what it means, but many, you know, some people go, yeah, so what? Other people are alarmed. 
If my salary was cut 28% tomorrow, I'd be really alarmed. <clears throat> I guess it depends on how you look at it. Uh, if you draw a box around these, uh, a continent, say, and you say, well, if the people of North America in this box had to subsist, or could only, a, all of their requirement could only be contained in that continent, then how much of a percentage? So it's 29%. So North Americans literally require, and that's just, this is just, you have to be careful, they require the equivalent of 29% of all the NPP that is generated in the entire North American continent. Okay, so now we don't eat twigs and leaves of trees and things like that. So it becomes significant when you realize that that's concentrated onto agricultural productivity land or forests that are being mined uh, for their uh, biomass. And you know, it varies depending on where you go. Draw, draw a box around Europe, 86%. Uh, India, South Central Asia, 96 I don't mean to pick on China. I just thought it was a, they had the, at the time they had, a, I already picked on India enough. And, and what I want to get a point across is if you just look at these red areas in here, it can be quite high. Um, it turns out actually India and China are fairly self-sufficient with food um, production. But the point is, is why isn't, why aren't all the people in these red areas and yellow areas starving to death? And that's because we have fossil fuel energy driven transportation and agricultural system. So even though we're not looking at fossil fuels here at all, we're seeing the impact of fossil fuels, you know, available energy. Um, that's the only way we can exist. So this gets back into the Malthusian scenarios again, where not only are you pushing the natural <laughs> landscape, but now you're also pushing the energy systems. And what happens if those do cross over? Um, the last point with this is that uh, the biosphere doesn't really care whether you have uh, a few people consuming a lot or a lot of people consuming a little. It's only about rates. If you overstretch the rate, then you know you've you've given you've put too much rate-based stress on the uh, mm -hmm. on the ecological infrastructure that you have to work with. And uh, this is North America's carbon consumption from and not 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 fossil fuels. Remember, this is only food and fiber and fuel and everything that you that we that uh, fuel being wood-based fuels, um, everything that comes from plants. Uh, North Americans account for about six uh, tons of carbon in plant products every year. Uh, people in South Central Asia, only about 1.23, but because of the high populations, the total population number is quite high. So um, we're, we're getting interest, actually, the, the Institute is doing something similar to this, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that, but we're getting a lot of interest from um, different groups in this, uh, including national security groups and people who just want to know what's, you know, what's going to happen. Um, we human beings are doing two things. We're increasing our populations and our consumption rates because we want to develop. And if you look at population increases, the blue line or the, the blue bar, um, and the per capita consumption of products of photosynthesis um, uh, by these regions, um, you can see that population is increasing here and the consumption, um, per capita consumption is increasing. That means that Africa as a whole, again, this is averaging all the countries in Africa, is actually in increasing its quality of life. Um, and so you have some areas where that's not happening and that's, that's a cause for concern. My colleague out at Ames, who's Indian, really worries about that. Where are we going? Uh, a lot of this has come back again. Uh, Steve Running just did a paper in Science last year about is NPP a planetary boundary? In other words, are, you know, will these rates basically cross over and will we hit some sort of a wall? Uh, our data, which we have yet to publish, it's my fault, I apologize to my team, um, is that uh, we're, we're looking at NPP. This is, this is the NPP for terrestrial systems based from AVHRR. These are MODIS-based NPP figures, and it looks pretty much like it just bounces around. It's not really doing much of anything, but the, per cap, but the, the human consumption rate is climbing. And again, both because of population increases and in momentum and because of per capita consumption. And um, when I was pitching this to the University of Pennsylvania's um, uh, urban studies program, um, 
the concern, uh, the concern that was voiced there is that as people urbanize, which they're doing all over the world, the consumption rate by individual goes up a lot. And one of the reasons is, it's very interesting, and I actually got this tidbit through a person who works for one of the big energy companies, um, who said it's because that when you're in a rural environment, you might have an average of, say, nine people per household. He said it's all about the households. But when people move to the city, there's like, there's like two people in a household. So the number of households per person increases when you urbanize, if you look at it that way. What does that mean? It means three times more refrigerators. It means three times more washing machines. It means three times more homekeeping consumption. Because now you don't have nine people sharing those things, you only have two. And so I thought that's an interesting tidbit. Um, and so, uh, so that sort of brings us back around to, well, you know, how do we address some of these really big issues that are coming up? And, and um, this, is this, this is the thing that attracted me to, to the Joint Global Change Research Institute, and that is, is this is integrated assessment modeling. And it's in its infancy. Um, and so if you can imagine how difficult it is to, to study the Earth system, imagine trying to put in the human dimension with economics and trade and, and the perspectives that the economists bring to this. But uh, this is what we're doing now. It's primarily funded by the Department of Energy. Um, and we are looking at how to bridge the gap between the natural Earth systems and the human-driven economic systems that have direct translations into how the land is used and how it's transformed and so on. Um, and I could, I could spend a lot of time on this, but right now we're, st we're struggling with all the things that anybody does in models when you try to look at how do you classify land cover. You know, and we have to classify it in a way that makes sense to economic use, and it turns out that that really doesn't match what the community likes to map cla uh, land cover for other uses. Um, to be fair, it also turns out that the, that the Earth system modeling community also doesn't like some of the land cover products that we put out at NASA because they need different things. So everybody has their, they have their plant functional types, which relate back to what they're modeling in the biogeochemical bio system. And we have our version of plant functional types or, or land functional groups that have to track to economic systems. And so, so we spend a lot of time translating back and forth. And there's a huge open area there for, for research. And I really want to get, I mean, so I'll put in my advertising. I really want to get NASA to work more closely with Department of Energy on this issue, because I think that it's just, there's some really interesting possibilities there for going forward. All right, so what are some of the things that we do at, at, at the Institute related to this? And you know, like I said, it's still in its infancy. We haven't quite addressed Club of Rome yet, but we're actually close to looking at it. Uh, uh, we think we'll find some very different um, um, findings. But uh, um, this is one of the things that, that, that we look at. A lot of people don't understand that as the climate, we've already experienced this, as you have warming spells, um, that uh, everybody's experienced a gold day, right? We're going to have some this summer. Well, it's not just because everybody's turning on their air conditioners. It's because uh, power generating facilities have to cool themselves. And they're surprisingly close to the point where the differential between what the water temperature in their holding ponds or out of the streams generate or if they're air cooled they're pretty close to being at that point where they, there's not enough temperature differential and they have to cut down the amount of power that they're actually generating. It's called derating. I never knew this. Um, and so, you know, this is like a load on a peak day, for example. This comes right out of the energy community. Here's the load during a severe day. So that's, that's the load. Um, this is what they plan for. Okay, so they're, they're, they're planning to be able to generate that. This is what happens when the wind dies down and it begins to get hotter and hotter and hotter. So this was a projection uh, as to you know, what would happen in a warmer climate. And you know, again, there's low wind and they're derating the output. And then this is where it's gotten to the point where they're having to cut down. And so this is where you have a brownout or a blackout. 
Okay. And so the fear here, the fear, the concern is, is that in a warming climate, how much, how many of these incidences are, are, are we likely to have with our current power infrastructure? Not just in the United States, but globally. So one of the things we we're doing is we're, we're looking at projections of future temperature change and then we're comparing it to these capacities to see where the grid's going to go down and what we ought to do about it. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is our GCAM model. This is publicly available. Uh, we actually have versions out there that will run on laptops, um, I understand. So, um, but it, it, it's a good graphic, and if you want to go and look up GCAM, you can Google it, and it tells you about all these different elements that we try to, we try to put to, together. But this particular one was we were asking ourselves similar question to the power, the power um, uh, um, question is what will happen in a future warmer climate with energy building, de uh, building energy demand and fuel use. And so they did two scenarios with a fixed climate and the A2, A2 climate and those of you that know about this, this is a, the IPC spends a lot of time trying to figure out what the parameters are for, for these uh, projections, but this is for the United States alone. Fixed climate, things pretty much kind of go along levelly, but in a warmer climate, we actually get an energy benefit. Okay, so that's, that was an interesting <coughs> finding. And, and if you look at what, what that is about, it's because we save a lot in gas and oil, which is primarily used for heating with a, in a warmer continental United States, but we also have to air condition more. So like anything with with, um, with climate change, there's winners and losers. So it depends on where you are and how it shifts. Um, and you know, this, is just, this is just one outcome of the model with that set of uh, parameters. But if you're, if you're an energy planner, you're very interested in this and you're interested in the shifts. And so this is, again, this is one of the, our very first attempts to look at what would climate change do to the, to the energy infrastructure. Um, another example is what happens, I hope this plays out, okay. What happens with, these are two scenarios. We can also test policy scenarios. Like what happens if you, um, uh, if you tax all carbon equally? This goes back to the sort of Kyoto Protocol. So in this scenario, this is land cover change out to 2095 in these categories. There are actually many more, but we, we could only show so much on a, on a uh, graphic like this. Um, how will land cover change? Remember, land cover change affects climate models, so I'll talk a little bit about that after this. But um, uh, how is that going to change if we put a carbon tax equally on everything from gas to coal to oil to wood to biofuels made from corn? Okay, Essentially, Nothing much happens. If you take away the tax on biofuels, then there's rapid land transformation. And so we projected that out using economics models. So it wasn't, you know, so it's kind of a no-brainer. Yeah, if you don't, if you tax fossil fuels but don't tax biofuels, people are going to what? They're going to do a lot more biofuels. But knowing how much land is going to change, where it's going to change, is what the model does. And so you can see massive deforestation here favoring bioenergy crops. And, if, and there's been several articles out lately, one in PNAS that talks about how marginal lands could be, could be employed for bioenergy crops as we know which ones to use. So big land cover changes. And so one of the things we have now is um, the integrated earth, earth system modeling effort where we're trying to get these results to feed back in at, at, at these different time intervals into climate models. So you know, so you can test a policy and land cover change, and that goes back into the, cli into the climate model. So we're working with, um, with Berkeley and uh, Oak Ridge National Labs and, and uh, MIT on that one. Okay, so finally, uh, what I'd like to see us do at some point is sort of reevaluate Club, Club of Rome, but I, I always think this is important to, to show. These are different, this was a model intercomparison looking at how much more agricultural productivity do we need to feed the planet as compared to 2005, out in 2030 and 2050. 
And you know, you can see there's pretty big difference. One one model says, you know, almost four and a half times we have to boost our productivity, our agricultural productivity, four and a half times over what it is now. Uh, but other models come in at a more modest, modest level, 2.5. Nobody really knows. And what we haven't done here yet is couple climate change into that. So if rainfall patterns shift, things dry out, that's going to really have an interplay. And so our next step is to look at those interactions. I believe that we have one of the few models that can do that. Maybe some of these other ones can. Um, but this, that, that would be interesting. OK, so anyway, I'm, I'm finished. Uh, the, the point I wanted to sort of get across is that um, we live in a pretty interesting time in terms of the fact that we're facing some really huge issues with human population growth, consumption, how we use the land surface, biogeochemical cycling, um, uh, and our survival on the planet. Uh, but we also have incredible tools. I mean, we've developed this tool set, which, you know, 30 years ago would have seemed like, you know, fantasy, well, even though we were trying to plan for it. But who knew that it would be so successful? So uh, any, anyway, that's all I got. I'll just open it up for, for discussion. Right, thanks. OK, some few comments uh, from the audience. Yes, please. Hey, Daniel. How are you? Uh, OK, nice talk, Mark. Hey. Um, in, for centuries, humans knew how to build uh, cooler homes and cooler, cool, cooler <coughs> homes than we build today because we rely on AC. Right. And right. that uh, may be uh, something to think about in a planning for the future. Yeah, 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 the, uh, that's, uh, that's exactly right. And, and we had a discussion at, at the University of Pennsylvania just um, two days ago about this is, and, and you know there's um, uh, w especially when you're teaching students this is really a good thing to remind them there are there are there are two issues in terms of warming if you just simplify it down it's sort of re reductionist there are many more but there's greenhouse gases and then there's forcing you know and they're not necessarily the uh, the uh, same. And when you talk about urban places, it's really important to choose materials that have albedo and emissivity characteristics that will ameliorate you know, the heating of the surfaces. Because the surfaces will radiate into you and you will experience that, even though it might not raise the air temperature very quickly as human beings with you know, bags of mostly water. Um, you, know, you will experience some heating from the surfaces. And so, um, so there have been some, you know, there's there's a big in, uh, um, industrial scale effort to re-roof large um, sections of New York City, for example, with uh, cool roofs. So there's a, there's a lot of work out there to reduce at least the the sort of uh, the, the the surface heating. Um, and uh, so yeah, you're right. I think there's a lot there, and I think people, especially as floor the the I don't have numbers for it, but people are very concerned about the floor space that's being built in the world. It's like it's some enormous number. And that floor space is air conditioned and heated. And so how, how we're going to do that is, is pretty interesting. Well, yes, yeah. Not. So at the risk of sounding like a terrible Malthusian pessimist, <laughs> if sometime in the next 20 or so years there's a terrible disaster and half of us die, does that just, you know, push us back a few decades on the uh, exponential growth of the boom and bust? Or, I mean, have you tried simulating this? Is it like a... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because I want to keep my job, I do not simulate it. Yeah. No, uh, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a really good, good, good question. Here's why that's difficult to actually simulate. It's a very complicated system. Um, we have a hard time just agreeing on scenarios with the best people in the world sitting in one room about how you would project forward. Okay, and that's with kind of known trajectories. So when you start doing that sort of thing and trying to look at the real out of the box stuff, it becomes very complicated. Fun, I think it's really fun. Uh, if we can find somebody who will fund us to do it, I'll be right there. Um, but uh, 
you know, there's many things you have to take into consideration. I, I think the biggest one without any question is what's going to happen to the availability in this scenario that you just mentioned? Um, uh, what's going to happen to the availability of internal combustion engines? Because you know, if you still have oil or some fuel that will run internal combustion engines and the ability to make them, then yes, the populations will just spurt right back up again. Because with, with internal combustion engines, you can till soil, you can generate fertilizers, you can transport it, you can do something like a hundred times more hours worth of work with a, with a, um, a liter of petrol than you can with human labor. So all the wealth you see around you is because of the internal combustion engine and oil. Seriously. It's, I'm going to Chris, yeah. Tom, and then go ahead. Please. Can you say something about the uh, global phosphorus uh, uh, limits, uh, its resource, and how that relates to fertilizers for agriculture? Yeah, I, I, I don't know about that. I, I, but, I, but I do know it's a big concern. Yeah. I, but I just, I'm the wrong guy to ask for that, sorry. But yeah. the, okay. Chris, going, going back to your... Uh, <coughs> Somebody here probably knows. Uh, yeah. And I just wanted to say that the calculation that you have done, that you have showed here, are within the limit of the available nutrients globally. Right. So we didn't, the calculation didn't go over. Yeah, yeah, and, and actually, if you think about the last 20 years, a lot of nitrogen fertilization is included in the, in the terrestrial MPP. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Chris, go Going back to your, your comment about the gas flaring uh, with all the, the fracking debate here in the States and the, the basically the glut of natural gas, um, I, I saw an article, I think, in the New York Times where Russia is going directly to natural gas powered vehicles in part because of questions about the, the impacts of hybrid battery production, right. et cetera. Yeah. So it, it, there may be mechanisms that were just being developed that will enable the capture and utilization right. of a lot of that energy. Yeah. So yeah, they're definitely, definitely working on it. That's a really good point. And you just remind me of something because I want to pass this on. Um, I, I hadn't been exposed to the energy energy producers mm -hmm. as a professional, um, as a part of my professional uh, life. And but I have been with this with this new job, and I am heartened. I'm really heartened to find that these these guys are very concerned about the environmental footprint of what they're doing. I mean, they're, you know, I mean, with, within limits, they have a business that they have to, to, to uh, main, maintain. But, you know, I, I was expecting a more sort of backward and draconian um, response from them. And, and it's, quite, it's quite the other way around. They're, they're actually very concerned and um, because their clients are asking for it. You know, I mean, so it's not, you know, it isn't quite as, as, as this probably is pretty wild and crazy, but I was heartened by, by this. Um, and um, so yeah, if they can, they know it's valuable. If they can find a way to make use, make use of it, they're, they're very much into it. And I was even surprised by one of the largest drillers um, that does oil and gas drilling for all of the companies. Who knew? They contracted out mostly. Okay, so there's like, there's like a few companies that do most of that. They, they told me, they said, wow, if, if you guys at NASA could find a way to figure out how much you know, fugitive methane there is you know, from our drilling operations, we would like to know because you know, we don't want any fugitive methane. <laughs> they want to sell it. Yeah. yeah. So, so they, they, they're surprisingly strong allies in some of these things. Um, now, the whole fossil fuel and you know, the, whole, the, whole, the whole issue there, and I get into this all the time, is that um, and this came with the coal and gas. You know, there's a lot of natural gas out there now, and it's changing the changing the um, the landscape. It's still putting CO2 in the atmosphere, and um, one of the horrifying um, outcomes of one of our models was is that you don't gain anything going from gas from coal to gas in terms of climate effects because the coal burning is a um, a badly orchestrated geoengineering feat in that you're putting all these aerosols that counter the greenhouse gases initially. Now the time scales haven't been quite quite worked out yet, but in the short time scales we had there was there was no benefit. Now there's a huge health benefit to not burning coal. We didn't include that. But it was one of the interesting realities of well there's CO2 and then there's aerosols. 
And you know, I think there was a talk here last week about will clouds save us from global warming? I wish I could have stayed for that. I wanted to hear about what that was about. But you know, there's still a lot we don't know about climate change, and I think we have to fess up to that. Uh, otherwise, the, the uh, public will say, you were wrong, you were wrong. They say, well, we're scientists. You, know, you always are wrong part of the time because that's how you learn. <laughs> Okay, last question. Uh, yeah. Now, you uh, shared a slide where um, uh, you were talking about how um, a carbon tax or a tax on fossil fuels could uh, encourage more biofuel production and therefore lead to more deforestation. Now, uh, but then on this slide right here, you mentioned that um, uh, land use trades for biofuel production are complex. And uh, so I'm wondering, have you looked into the effects of, um, well, uh, incentives for protecting forests? on uh, biofuel production. So for example, um, giving carbon credits or offsets for protecting forests. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. They may have done that. I know they have thousands of runs. But it is within the capability of the model to do that. I, I, I don't know if they've done it. Um, okay. I've only been there for a few months. So I don't okay, know. So let's, let's give Mark one more. Okay.